Hey, thanks for joining us this week. Uh, we're going to be talking about Group 5 racing. Yeah. Some of the coolest looking race cars to ever exist. They take a regular looking car and then they add a bunch of stuff to it. You ever seen right. Bosuzoku cars, RWB, Liberty Walk, Rocket Bunny? Yeah. These are the inspiration for those. They raced them all over the world. Porsche dominated until they didn't. Enter Mustang. What? Yeah. Listen, <laughs> it's a story. We but also talk about cysts. Cysts no. on our butts. <laughs> Rock and roll. <laughs> When the attendees of IMSA's 1981 Camel GT arrived at Sears Point, two things were immediately apparent. First, it was a great day, 76 degrees, sunny with a gentle breeze. The second was the charred hill where Hurley Haywood's Porsche 935 had caught fire and burnt to the ground just the day before. In the words of one fan reflecting on the event some 20 years later, in hindsight, maybe there's something very symbolic about that grass. The 70s and early 80s were practically an arms race of automotive engineering. From fuel injection to turbos to aerodynamics, manufacturers and privateers alike were breaking new ground in name of ever faster lap times. It was an age of pioneering that bridged the gap between the legends of the past and the racing we love today. And while Sears Point is no Le Mans, it does represent a moment in the ever evolving landscape of the sport that we can appoint to and say marked the end of an era. Today on Pass Gas, what was Group 5 special production? Why were the late 70s considered a golden era for circuit racing? And how did Ford manage to unseat one of the most successful Porsches ever made? This is the story of the Mustang that took down Porsche. Er, er, er. Hell yeah. Holler if you love Sears. Pass Gas Podcast. Big thanks to Fume for sponsoring this episode of Pass Gas. Start the year off right with the good habit by going to tryfume.com slash past and getting the journey pack today. Fume is giving listeners of this show 10% off when they use my code PAST, that's P-A-S-T, to help make starting the good habit that much easier. Thanks, Fume. I think that was kind of an unnecessary dig at Sears Point. It's like, and while Sears Point is no Lamar, it's like, whoa, hey, it's a hold good, up. Uh, it's good. Are you not going to believe mean, Sonoma? Yeah, yeah. Sonoma, yeah. right? Oh, we love that Sonoma. The old That's the name old name for it. For it yeah, okay. and then I think it was Infineon at one point, and now it's and Sonoma. now it's uh, now it's Chick Fil A, Jewel, <laughs> yeah, Jewel. Yeah, it's Jewel Melanin Vape <laughs> Raceway. <laughs> Uh, welcome back to Past Gas, everybody. My name is Nolan Sykes, joined as always by my co-host, James Humphrey. Give me back my son! And Joe Weber. Uh, keep it juiced. <laughs> Sorry, that, was, that was good. That was tight. Was it really? Dude, that was it. Oh, it sick, felt so bro. corny coming I, out. No, man, you were just nervous because it was new. Yeah, no, oh, okay. it felt good. It was sick, it felt dude. I just have to commit next time. I No, I loved it. Okay. I can't imagine what it would feel like if you committed. <laughs> if that wasn't commitment. Yeah. Dude, I don't good. know if I'm ready for that. I bailed a little bit. Come on. Oh, man. Okay. You're too humble. <laughs> and today we're talking about... Oh, wait. Oh, wait. And oh, Nolan oh. Sykes. Oh, yeah. Go ahead and give it the goose. Uh, go ahead and goose it. And then your new one. Get tilted, everybody. Yeah. Get tilted. Get Let's, tilted. Yeah. Let me try that one more time. Let's bring it back. Okay. Go ahead and goose it. But settle in. Get yourself a nice little snack, drink, whatever, or just... Uh, be at peace and get tilted with us today. Oh, oh that's what yeah. yeah. tilted yeah. means. Yeah. Like you're, yeah. Like get you're getting tilted. Cozy. Yeah, get tilted yeah. like this. Yeah. Also means like hammering it into the yeah, you're into like a tilted. turn. Yeah. yeah. Like, oh, or you're like tilted meetings. on an off road the bank. Yeah. You're like crawling up something. Mm -hmm. There's yeah. a lot of meanings. Tilted. Yeah. And also, I, I feel like a lot of people are probably listening to this at work. Solid IP. So don't get cozy and relax at your job because no. your boss will yeah. fire you. Your boss will fire you uh, because he's a fascist. Because he's not <laughs> tilted. He's not. Your boss, your boss not guy, tilted. Not tilted. Your boss, a little high strung. Yeah. Probably has a broom up his ass. <laughs> <laughs> Today we're talking about Group 5 Racing, which I think has produced some of the coolest looking race cars oh, out yeah. there. We're talking production cars that have crazy aerodynamics on them. Uh, you've probably seen these things they on... 
you know, very curated vintage yeah. motorsports yeah, Instagram yeah, 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 pages yeah, yeah. where it's like, oh, a simpler time. But like, that's not a simpler time. Patina that's research. Not, yeah, there's a lot of stuff going on. It's not that simple. Yeah, patina uh, research. Take that watermark out of your things. I want to share more of your stuff. I want to share more of your stuff, but I don't want anyone to know I, where you, I got the it. It's going to be on the bottom, <laughs> but, you know, it like kind of ruins the intro of the video. Yeah. The intro tag is a little much for Joe. They do great research. Yeah. Uh, and I love your page. Want to share more of your stuff. The Group 5 cars look a lot like uh, Bosuzoku mm. cars, but like actually actually what racy. Yeah, actual yeah. race cars. So these this is what became Silhouette cars. Mm. Uh, it went a thousand different directions. Well, Silhouette, that was over in Japan, right? Yeah. But, I mean, it went from like road racing to rally racing to... Now it's um, back to road racing again. Okay. This has been a bunch of different types of racing. Group five has. Mm. So. Nice. Okay. Um, I my favorite group of five is the Backstreet Boys. Oh. Uh, in sync? Question. No. Mark? I thought you were gonna talk about that show from the nineties with a group of five, party of five. Yeah. With Jennifer her, Love Hewitt. Group of five. Jennifer group, Love Hewitt. That's Jennifer what they said at the restaurant Hewitt, in the beginning of, of five, the show. Party of five. <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer Love Hewitt, Nev Campbell, yeah. Charlie, Nev some Campbell. guy named Luke has cancer. What? Some guy named Luke in that. Some too. guy named Luke in that too. <laughs> Party of five. Yeah. Cool. I'm excited. Let's yeah. get into it. I'm always excited. I'm always excited Stoked for this Stoked. episode and to read this story to you. Let's Group get into it. Five. Let's strap it on. Let's strap it on. Let's strap it on and go at each other. <laughs> <laughs> the history of Group 5 racing is complicated and takes a lot of left turns, so to speak. Uh, and right ones. <laughs> where it started and where it ended are two completely different places. But without the people that made it possible, we wouldn't have some of our favorite race cars of all time. Yeah. Introduced by the FIA in 1966, the title Group 5 applied to four generations of regulations. The first, special touring cars, were adopted for the British Saloon Car Championship beginning in 66, then the European Touring Car Championship in 68. The so rules... this car is like the Jennifer Love Hewitt. Okay. Uh-huh. Uh, the rules were simple. There were none. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> Got me in the first half. Huh? Yeah. This was a category made for highly modified touring cars, so every detail was left up to the manufacturers. The special touring cars category was discontinued after the 69 season and replaced by the sports car class, who had previously been considered group four sports cars, okay? The minimum production requirement was only 25 units, and the engine capacity was limited to 5,000 cubic centimeters or five liters. Five liters, big. that's a big old boy. Yeah. A honking V8. Yeah. yeah. Especially, I mean, in the context of European cars, like that's that's, that's as big as they big. get. Yeah, yeah. Um, but other than those rules, uh, the freedom to choose what to do was up to the manufacturer. And this era includes legends like Porsche's first Le Mans winner, the 1970 Salzburg 917K, and the 1971 Martini 917K, which set a Le Mans distance record that wouldn't be beaten until 2010. Whoa! What? Yeah. Yeah. That means it did the most laps. It's like 150 years. <laughs> it also included the Ferrari uh, 512S and the Ferrari 512M. The sports car class pushed car manufacturers to compete with prototypes, and even though the new rules were supposed to encourage further technological progress, their frequent changes to the regulations, as well as the skyrocketing costs, turned many fans and manufacturers away from Group 5 in favor of F1. Simply put, it didn't make financial sense for teams to have their top-of-the-line racing programs split across two FIA categories, and with the meteoric rise of Formula One, brands like Ferrari and Alfa Romeo consolidated their efforts there. I mean, it makes sense because, like, this is, like, a no-holds-barred, mm -hmm. uh, like, racing series. Like, just make them as mm -hmm. fast as you can, but then you also have to base it on a road-going car. Yeah. Whereas, like, F1 is, like, make it as fast as you can. Yeah. And you don't have to base it on anything. I think I'm more attracted to something like Group 5. Same. I like to use my imagination and be like, that's my car. Like, yeah. Yeah. the first thing I did when you started reading is, like, I Googled Group e 5 BMW. Yeah. There was the E21. But, I uh, mean, oh, yeah. Okay. Because so you're like, that's my car. 
Yeah, and yeah. Like that's easier to root for your why home I, team. If it wasn't Ferrari and Alfa Romeo leading the charge on that, uh-huh. it's possible that Group 5 would still be super relevant right. today maybe because, I mean, those brands already had a very strong lineage in Formula 1 mm-hmm. and Grand Prix racing. Uh, they were probably already more interested in that from the get. And then if you're if those guys leave, the other manufacturers are like, okay, if the best has like yeah. left, then like right. And uh, like Ferrari's not known as whoa, oh almost my spilled God. my water bottle all over Joe's computer. That was crazy. And, Fer- and my phone. And Ferraris, and my crotch. Ferraris are already so like out of the realm of possibility for most people that you don't mm-hmm. get that from watching a Ferrari race where you do from watching like a BMW or a Mustang yeah. Yeah. or even oh. a Porsche. You can see like yeah. the skeleton of my own car in totally. there with all that buff stuff on top of it. That's but what like it could the buff be. stuff, dude. Yeah. But then a Ferrari, you're like, well, that still looks totally. like a spaceship. I wonder how they landed on 25 cars, though. It seems pretty arbitrary. <laughs> yeah. Well, for homologation. I mean, that's... I know, but they're like, well, I guess just make like 25. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Uh, speaking of BMW, yeah. I've never really been a big BMW person. Mm-hmm. I respect the brand, obviously, yeah. and their efforts. I've, but I fought it, but I'm, I'm, uh, I am. On Monday, you we shot a video. being a Beamer guy? Yeah. Why? Because, you know, association. The culture? I think that's kind of died culture, off a little yeah. bit, though, in like the last 10 years. BMW makes great cars. They make awesome cars, but like the perception of the BMW driver is now just like the Tesla driver here yes. in LA. We drove a 330i, like base level mm-hmm. versus, not versus, but like compared it to... The M3, the M3 CS. CS. Oh, yeah. God. Dude, it was, I mean, M3 CS, obviously, an yeah. amazing car. Mm-hmm. Super fun, super scary on the track. But the 330i, too, like, you feel the foundation that they built mm-hmm. that crazy car on top of. That's it's awesome. like, it's obviously not as good. The tires on it sucked. It had a lot of body roll, but it was still very, very good. I'm like, oh. Yeah. It's still got the I, same belly. I kind of like the it's BMW. The, uh, the ultimate driving machine. It, yeah. it really is. I have a BMW, and it's my favorite car I've ever owned. Like, I don't know. Like, it just feels exactly how I've always thought yes. a car should feel. Yeah. Then when I bought that 330Ci, I was like, this is a piece of shit, and it's still so fun. Yeah. And oh, yeah, you had one of those, huh? Yeah, and yeah. you drove it, too, and you're like, oh, it's great. my uncle used to have these, yeah. now I get it. Yeah, yeah, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> it's just like the steering wheel is right where it should be, yep. and the shifter's right where it mm-hmm. should be. Yeah. And, the, and it feels f- just narrow. Uh, you're probably even more so, mm-hmm. but it just feels like you're in this little, like, cart, mm-hmm. and it's it's just the, got as yeah. much power as you want. You know my favorite part it's of BMW is, though? What? The extendable thigh thing on the seats. Yeah. My, why, yeah. why doesn't every car have that? Dude, mine is- <laughs> I need that. Almost 40 years old and it has that. That's yeah. crazy. That's crazy. That's uh, crazy. And mine's bright red. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So back in group five, uh, there was an effort to make the regulations a little bit more organized. The FIA reviewed its classification. Okay. So from 72 until 76, the rules excluded the minimum production requirement. So they didn't have to build those 25 cars. Yeah. And they limited the engine capacity to just 3,000 cubic centimeters or three, three liters. liters. Fago. <laughs> But everything changed again in 1976. When America was founded. (laughs) Rather than attempt to save the increasingly unpopular prototypes, the FIA reworked Group 5 regulations once again. The idea was this. A category for nearly unrestricted race cars built off production models people already know and love. Perfect idea. They called it Group 5 Special Production. And this notable era extended from 76 until 1982. That's what we're focusing on today. It is pretty crazy that we're, we've only been a country for like over 200 years. But It'll still, be 250 in three year, uh, two years. 250 years is like nothing for a country. I mean, it's also quite a lot for a lot of countries. Yeah. A lot of countries were formed like in the 60s, I guess. Well, it's like in Mighty Ducks 2 when they're having history class. Yeah. The teacher says like, yeah, we're just a teenager like you guys. Like the teen, <laughs> like the Mighty Ducks, they're all teens. Yeah. And then she's like, well, the United States is a teenager too. Oh, okay. Uh, and then Goldberg's yeah. like, Wah. Goldberg's like, oh, I diarrhea. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oopsie, I diarrhea. Oopsie. I haven't seen that movie since I was like four years old, I think. Really? Mighty Ducks too. Yeah. Wow. Is that the one where they go to Minnesota? Mighty Ducks too. They're uh, in the Olympics. Oh, the what? Junior Olympics. <laughs> oh. oh. <laughs> then the, the we third, made some changes to the rules, yeah. and kids are in. <laughs> then Mighty Ducks three, they go to this like elite high school. That's and, what I think is in Minnesota. Yeah, and they're the JV team, and like the varsity is like, you guys aren't so hot. 
and then they like play a game. Uh, spoiler alert. Then they, they play <laughs> a game D3. Yeah, for yeah. D3 Mighty Ducks. They play a game against the varsity team and like the Mighty Ducks win and like the whole varsity team is like not on the team anymore. And the Mighty <laughs> Ducks are just the varsity team now. And like as like you can't. A normal person can't like feel proud of the Mighty Ducks because you're like, oh, you just ruined all those kids' lives. Like, yeah, that was like, like they're gonna be their yeah you know, meal ticket. They should have been yeah. better players. Well, they should have been, be but yeah. that's also not how sports work. Like some of them would try out mm -hmm. and make it. Yeah, some of them would try out yeah. and not make it. They what would, would really happen is that that they beat varsity, and then varsity for the next practice has to do like suicides right. all the, the yeah, whole yeah, practice. Yeah, yeah. But then they would still be varsity. Yeah. Yeah. They would still be varsity, yeah. and like. Charlie would probably they, start on varsity. Do you think they still call it suicides? That drill where you run back and forth between the no, lines? No, it's ladders. Ladders. Oh, yeah. that is so weak. But they, it, it, the full name is ladders that you hang yourself from. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. okay. Ladders you use to climb up to the rafters <laughs> and tie a, a rope and hang yourself. Okay, so from the from 1976 until 1982, <laughs> honestly, it's much more graphic. <laughs> so from 76 to 82, the rules are simple: and less than two and a half pages. That's a rule book I want to read. The regulations yeah. demanded that the cars had to retain a silhouette resembling oh. the original production car, an engine type homologated to that car, engine type. So like a V8. I think so. Is that up for interpretation? I think that's pretty loose. Yeah, that's and loose. And a handful of panels such as doors and a hood. Yes. Retaining production dimensions. Yes. Dimensions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so not yeah. the crazy Bozuzoku ones. No, the... Oh, a handful of panels. Yeah, but like, so not, not, but not like the actual. Ones that never change. It doesn't have to be the actual panel. It's just yeah. the same dimensions. Dimensions. So like the doors have to be the same size. So they like, can be made out of paper. They can be made out of yeah, paper. Yeah. I love this. Uh, yeah. That was the rules. That was it. Almost everything else could be made bespoke to achieve maximum performance. Occasionally referred to as silhouette cars. There you go. Engineers were given full license to run wild. Uh, creating cars that barely resembled their production counterparts. Often putting speed over safety, Group 5 cars battled it out all over the world in series like the World Championship for Makes. Love that. Name. Great name. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the Deutsch Rennsport Meistercraft, or DRM. Mm -hmm. You had IMSA GTX here in the States, and you had All Japan Sports Prototype Championship over there in Japan. So those are like the more famous ones, m more famous silhouette cars that we know. Mm -hmm. Some really sick ones, but I really like the German ones too. Yeah. Deutsch Rennsport Meistercraft. Der, der, mm. <laughs> <laughs> Big thanks to Electric E-Bikes for sponsoring this episode of Pass Gas. Do you like cars but wish they had two wheels and pedals? You might like electric e-bikes. Riders of all abilities can explore this new year with electric bikes. Go to electricebikes.com to learn more about their wide selection of e-bikes that start at just $799 with the XB Lite. That's L-E-C-T-R-I-C-E bikes.com. Electric sent us one of the XP 3.0s. It's a burly little beast and it's super fun. I did a bunch of errands. The battery life is really long and it's got this cool little like handlebar throttle. I was going like 14 miles an hour up a hill. So I really like it. I think you should go try one out. They're great. They finance for as low as $49 a month. So if you don't got that scratch, you can just finance it. So explore 2024 with electric e-bikes, the most accessible and adventurous e-bikes ever. Visit electricebikes.com to learn more. And be sure to mention that Pass Gas by Donut Media sent you in the post checkout survey. That's L-E-C-T-R-I-C-E-E-Bikes.com. Big thanks to BetterHelp for sponsoring this episode of Pass Gas. A common misconception about relationships is that they always have to be easy or quote unquote right. But sometimes the best ones happen when both people put in the work to make them great. Therapy can be a place to work through the challenges you face in all of your relationships, whether it's with friends, work, or your significant other. BetterHelp, in my mind, is the best way to get into therapy if you've never done it before. They make it so freaking easy. All you do is fill out this little survey that helps you match with a therapist that can help you out. If you don't like them, you switch to a new therapist. 
I think it's a great system. Best part about BetterHelp, it's entirely online, so you don't have to go into an office. If you want to give therapy a try, become your own soulmate, whether you're looking for one or not. Visit BetterHelp.com slash PassGas today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash PassGas. From the beginning of the 1976 Group 5 regulations, Porsche dominated thanks to a win at the World Championship for makes by legendary driver Jochen Maas mm. and Jackie Ix, as well, as well as the car that would come to define Group 5, the Porsche 935. Now, Jochen Maas has that helmet that we all love, uh, the skull Is one. that him? That's him. Okay. Not Jochen Rint. It's Jochen we Maas. always... Maas. We, it made a mistake in the past. We called him Jochen Rint. Yeah, it's Jochen Mass. Mass has Mass. the skull helmet. Yeah. yeah, the sickest helmet ever. It is. Based on the 911 Turbo, the 935 was visually distinguished by its aerodynamic flat nose and striking double rear wing. Mm. Oh, oh flat nose. Yeah. that's cool. Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah. The double wing like, is yeah. really you could sick. Eat a Christmas dinner off of that. You yeah. eat so a freaking flat. Christmas goose off that. Schnoz. Oh, it's so <laughs> greasy. <laughs> <laughs> After, <laughs> what? <laughs> the goose greasy. is a lot of fat. Yeah. Greasy, greasy bird. Yeah, it's use, a greasy bird. They use yeah. goose fat in uh, French fries. Don't eat yeah. a, a goose when you're on Ozempic, I guess, right? Yeah, yeah. you'll die. That's a project <laughs> Usually you I'm, should I'm all undertake. about, you know, giving it the goose. Yeah. yeah. But oh. not if you're on Ozempic. But not if you're on Ozempic. If you ever yeah. do an ad read for Ozempic. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And remember, guys, don't normally, give yeah. it the goose. Normally, <laughs> normally we're all about giving it the goose here at Gas Gas. Yeah. On Ozempic, try and stay away from such a greasy bird. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> After some tweaks, the addition. I am thinking about going on Ozempic, so that's why we're talking about Are you? About oh, really? <laughs> you should. What? <laughs> I feel like I've trimmed down a little bit since Christmas. Yeah, for sure. I, I drank a lot over Christmas break. Did you really? Yeah, I was like nonstop. Dude. It's bad news, man. Yeah. After some tweaks and the addition of a second turbocharger. <laughs> <laughs> that was oh a good God. gurgle, too. <laughs> Okay. So <laughs> Your liver is yeah. failing. Yeah. Oh. Oh, I'm on a free trial of his oh, no. <laughs> oh. uh, You ate so much pork belly this yeah. morning, bro. I watched yeah. you. <laughs> I come in, I make a giant cup of coffee, and just eat pork belly. Yeah. I don't just... know even know why we stock it in our fridge, but we do. Yeah, we do. After some tweaks and the addition of a second turbocharger in 1977, the 935-77 boasted a 2,857cc flat six by turbo engine capable of up to 630 hertz per Man. This thing's sweet. So th this is uh, kind of like the car they, that... If you've seen BC Moto and his... Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's the one he based it off yeah, of? Yeah. I mean, this is pretty close to that. He's got the whale tail. Whale tail yeah. on the back. Very flat. Um, cut off of the tail at the back there too, and it has like a that more Daytona pronounced effect. Yeah, yeah, it has more of like a pronounced like fastback as well. This thing's sweet, dude. It's uh, almost like the silhouette is calling to me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys, six hundred thirty horsepower, <laughs> and it only weighed a little over two thousand pounds. God, that would be kind what of a hard Nolan bench presses. Yeah, used to be eight times. That'd be a pretty hard car to control. Me thinks I bet that would be a not a uh, one for amateurs. Yeah. As a result of these <laughs> changes, a Porsche 935 won eight of the first nine races that season. Wow. You imagine like that one day that they didn't win, they were yeah. probably so bummed. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, nine. <laughs> <laughs> to illustrate <laughs> just how successful the 935 was in Group Five, in the rare instances the factory Porsche team didn't win. One of the competing private 935s often would. That's how you know it's good. Yeah. That's how you know it's good. That's how you know it's good when the rich guys win, too. <laughs> Despite its dominance, Porsche wasn't content to rest on the laurels of the 935-77. In 1978, they introduced the most powerful 911-maced model ever made, the 935-78. Oh, known it just by many better. as Moby Dick. <gasps> the whale? Yeah. For its wide, long tail body. 
The 93578 was the culmination of the 935's development efforts. It differed from previous models in its modified frame, aerodynamically optimized body, and the fact that it was right-hand drive. Whoa. Hmm. Why? JDM much? (laughs) (laughs) Though there were initially problems with the cylinder heads, they were simply welded together. Whoa. Hmm. For cooling, water was used to cool the cylinder heads. This is what yeah. BC Moto really based their 935 off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this is the Moby Dick. The this, this is the famous boy, Moby Dick. And Day. he made fully electric, right? Yeah, he's he electric. A, yeah. yeah. And I Rod Chong can, has one, too. Yeah. I think you can buy... Oh, yeah, that one's sweet. I think you can have him build it with, like, a turbo engine, not EV. Uh-huh. Like you can have it either way if you want. Busy Moto? I think so. You can buy that car from him? He makes... you can If you commission one, yeah. What? Yeah. Do you have to get it? What do you... There's multiple. There's a few of these cars out there, like Rod Chong's. And then there's another one. There's another EV one that has like a really long swept tail. I think I saw that at the Purist event. Is it pink? No, it's black. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. BC's is pink. Right. Yes. But did those really start as 935s or were they 911s that they just extended? I would... I, would guess. Those are I think Rods is a 935. Really? Wow. Yeah. That's wild. But I, why would you take, like, I mean, for the electric one, it could just be a 911. That has to be a yeah. clone of some, uh, yeah. yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I guess we could ask him. Yeah. We nah, could. We have his phone number. <laughs> no, we should speculate. Yeah. <laughs> for cooling, uh, water was used to cool the cylinder heads, and air was used to cool the cylinder. So a little, little hybrid what? cooling system. Wow, weird. With the newly introduced four-valve technology, the Boxer engine had two turbochargers with charge air cooling at its disposal. And with the enlarged 3,211cc engine, the 93578 could put out, gentlemen, 845 Herspers. That is fast. Yeah. Moby Dick was retired after only a few races. But at the 24 hours of Le Mans, the car hit an incredible 227 dang, miles per hour dang. in the straights. That's scooting. Yeah. <laughs> and drivers Manfred Schurti and Rolf <laughs> Stamenlin. What? Manfred Schurti. Manfred Schurti. And Rolf Stamenlin finished eighth overall. Moby Dick might be the most iconic Group 5935, but shockingly, it was not the fastest. That title isn't even held by the factory Porsche team. Instead, it belongs to the Kramer-built 935K3. Brothers Irwin and Manfred Kramer were long-established Porsche dealers and modifiers who opted to develop their own 935 for Group 5. Hmm. The German brothers honed their concept with the K3 in 1978, introducing revised aerodynamics and switching out the stock air-to-water intercooler with an air-to-air intercooler, which lightened the overall weight and eliminated the risk of cooling system leaks. The result was the most successful 935 ever put on the track. The 935-77.961-234. It's the K3. K3, I would not name anything K3. Why? KKK. Oh. Yep. <laughs> I thought you were like, oh, I don't want to be associated with K2 because that's the most scary mountain to climb. Yeah, K that's cubed. That's K-cubed. also KKK. Yeah. That's more KKK. <laughs> yeah. Yep. K, let's move on. <laughs> 80, 80 cubic feet a woman. <laughs> Kramer's Porsche 935 K3 was ready to race in the 1979 Zolder round of the German Sports Car Championship. Driver Klaus Ludwig, the most German name ever. <laughs> if you were making a joke about a German guy, you might call him Klaus Ludwig. Klaus Krampus Ludwig. <laughs> <laughs> he drove the car to an impressive debut victory, beating a field packed with Porsche-built 935s. He continued his good form throughout the season and won 10 races out of a possible 11. At the Nürburgring, he set a lap time of 7.33, which to put into context would have been fast enough to qualify for the last F1 race held at the Nürburgring. Yeah, I think the the Taycan just got 707. No shit. Yeah, yeah. Taycan's fast. It as beat the crazy. it beat the um so fast. plaid yeah, well, well, by like 23 seconds. Wow. Well, it's because they've been making cars for more than six years. Yes. And they like them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nerb time. Wow, shots fired, wow, dude. Wow, shots fired. 707, that is 
That's so fast. Fast as shit. Because they understand suspension. That's real fast. With co-drivers and brothers Don and Bill Whittington, Ludwig led the Kramer Le Mans effort and piloted the K3 to the first Le Mans win for a production-based car since the Second World War. Overall win, guys. At Le Mans. Yeah. In a production-based car. Wow. Production-based. That is very, very impressive. That's insane. To put that into context, that's if like if you took our Civic and won Le Mans. It's exactly like that. It's exactly like that. <laughs> That'd be sick. That'd be sick. If we won Le Mans in this Civic, dude, <laughs> think about it, man. It'd be sick. It'd be so sick. Ever. Write it down, yeah. man. Let's do it. Okay. <laughs> Let's do it. I'm actually going to do it. Le Mans win. in June. Dude. Le Mans. Deadline. June. In Civic. Yeah. Win. Underline. Win. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's. Okay, it's good. There, it's win. Okay, win. Yeah, because yeah, that's the important part. Yeah, nobody gives a shit if you. <laughs> no, man, we gotta win it in the Civic. That'd be sick. Yeah, win. overall win. <laughs> That'd be so sick. <laughs> so it's like, you know, how many people would be like, "Yo, Yo you guys, no way, <laughs> no way, you guys." A YouTube channel won Le Mans in a 1993 <laughs> Civic. That'd be sick. Cool. <laughs> mm-hmm. oh. And then we'd have our moment, and then we would go back to our lives. We go back to our lives, <laughs> logging in the content yeah. mines. <laughs> 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 this was a feat that couldn't be repeated until the McLaren F1 in 1995. Wow. It had become impossible to ignore the overwhelming success of the 935. So unless you were driving a Porsche, chances are their domination was getting annoying. (laughs) Oh, I'm so annoyed. I'm so annoyed by this Uh, freaking car. That's exactly what Ford was saying. Yes. After dominating the (laughs) Deutsche Rennsport Meistercraft, uh, for five years, this is the precursor to the German Touring Car Series, uh, they were perhaps starting to get a little cocky about their winning streak, and that was thanks to Ford's partnership with Zach Speed. Founded by Prussian-born Eric Zakowski after the Second World War, Zach Speed Racing started as a small garage, modifying Ford Escort 1300 GTs for races at the Nürburgring. We talked about those cars mm-hmm. last time we talked, you guys. Yeah, very cool cars. After they caught Ford's eye with their 1300, Zach Speed was officially brought on to prepare works, escorts, and capris. And soon, Zach Speed became Ford's official DRM team during its Group 2 touring car years, establishing a working relationship between the two that would continue well into the next decade. I didn't know that Ford was in DTM. Oh, dude, you're about to find out. From 1972 until 1976, Zach Speed was behind every single DRM championship winning car. Wow. Wow. Perhaps the most special of these was the iconic Ford Escort RS 1600 Mark I, which featured a modified Ford BDA dual overhead cam engine bored out to two liters, producing 250 brake horsepower. Driven by the very German-sounding Hans Heyer, <laughs> this Escort claimed a DRM championship title in both 75 and 76. Then, in 1977, the series opened up to allow Group 5 cars to complete. To com- Sorry, shit. Oh, Shit. almost perfect. Compete is what I meant to say. Yeah. They allowed Group 5 cars to compete. Not only did Group 5 prosper, but it drew more cars than the World Championship for makes, which was the series Group 5 rules were created for. The only problem, you ask? Yeah. It became yet another arena where Porsches dominated. There's right. so many acronyms in here. There is a lot, yeah, but it's fine. Acronyms. It made me think of a cool rapper name. Just the letters B-D-I. Like BDI? Oh, yeah. BDI? Yeah. BDI. Yeah. You're always squinting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> looking back and forth. BDI. The DRM. That sounds like a reggae guy's name. BDI. Yeah. BDI. BDI. <laughs> Fuck Ken. <laughs> You're just like a white guy yeah. doing like, I'm doing hip hop infused reggae I'm music. from Ontario. I'm from Zig-a-zag. Placentia. <laughs> Placentia. I'm from Placentia. Shouts to the Cottonmouth King. <laughs> yeah. Dude, yeah, that sounds like a guy that would show up on one of their tracks. BDI? Which, BDI, yeah. yeah. Recriminalize it. Recriminalize <laughs> it. <laughs> Featuring BDI and, uh, <laughs> and, like, and Shaggy Shake Tudo. and the Killer or something yeah. like that. And you're like, who's this guy? Yeah. And yes. Rome. And Rome, dude. Did you see that Rome got kicked out? Yeah. Or they're, getting, they're replacing him with mm-hmm. Brad's son. Yeah. yeah. Is this 
Codmouth Kings? No, no Sublime. Sublime with uh, Rome. Is, no. He's getting... This is his la- these last scheduled shows will be his last shows with Sublime. Oh, man, let's go. It's been a great 15 years, and he thinks... He's been with them a long time. <laughs> yeah, way longer <laughs> than Brad Knoll. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great point. Wow. But he didn't write any songs. No. No, they did. Oh, really? There's some Sublime with Rome songs, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think they... I mean, they're new stuff, I would assume. They have new stuff? Dude. <laughs> <laughs> After the show, we're going to hang out. Okay. Yeah. Maybe. We're going to explore this discography. Maybe. <laughs> we're going to take some, some um, flavored vapes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, Just, we probably... We're going to get tilted. Let's get tilted. To sublime, dude. Sublime. Big thanks to Fume for sponsoring this episode of Past Gas. Have you ever tried to break a bad habit and felt like it's impossible? Like he just can't do it? Well, luckily there's Fume. It's not about giving up, it's about switching up. Fume takes your habit and simply makes it better, healthier, and a whole lot more enjoyable. Fume is an innovative, award-winning flavored air device that does just that. Instead of vapor, Fume uses just flavored air. And instead of electronics, Fume is completely natural. And they don't even have harmful chemicals, just delicious flavors. People are raving about Fume. Uh, The taste is great. The feel of it, the look. Plus, they just released a magnetic stand for your fume, so there's no more losing it around the house. When I was quitting smoking, I really could have used something like fume. And if something can mimic it but be healthier, that's great. Start the year off right with a good habit by going to tryfume.com slash past and getting the journey pack today. Fume is giving listeners of this show 10% off when they use my code PAST, that's P-A-S-T, to help make starting the good habit that much easier. Thanks, fume. Big thank you to Subaru for sponsoring this episode. For anyone who believes that life is about the journey, not the destination, discover the 2024 Subaru Crosstrek Wilderness. Adventure is a big part of an active lifestyle, but sometimes you gotta push it to the edge. The Subaru Crosstrek has always appealed to the adventure seekers with its legendary standard symmetrical all-wheel drive. But now, the Subaru Crosstrek Wilderness goes even further. An enhanced dual-function X-Mode combined with 9.3 inches of ground clearance gives increased capability. Tough new off-road wheels with all-terrain tires designed for even more daunting trails. This trusty Subaru is built to take you to the limit, and yet its retuned standard EyeSight driver assist technology is there to watch over you. Bold accent colors and new rugged exterior houses its equally durable water-repellent StarTech seats in a surprisingly spacious cabin. When I saw Subaru first introduce their wilderness line, I was like, when are they gonna do the Crosstrek? And now since it's been revealed, dude, this thing looks dope. Give it a look. This thing is super versatile and capable. It's at home, on the road, or out in the bush, helping you with your camping trip. The Wilderness is the top of the Crosstrek range. You're not going to be able to buy a more capable Crosstrek from the dealer. you got to go with the Wilderness. Discover the Subaru Crosstrek Wilderness, the newest member of Subaru's Wilderness family. Adventure on the edge. Learn more at Subaru.com. EyeSight is a driver assist system that may not operate optimally under all driving conditions. The driver is responsible for safe and attentive driving. System effectiveness depends on many factors. See your owner's manual. Big thanks to Chime for sponsoring this episode of Past Gas. It's a new year, and with the new year comes some new things you want to buy. Maybe something you didn't get for Christmas that you really wanted. Something that you would put on a credit card. So no matter how you're starting off the year, when you use the secured Chime Credit Builder Visa credit card, you can build your credit scores with on-time payments for everyday purchases. If there were an overachieving credit card that helps you build credit, this would be it. Some of the best aspects of the Chime Credit Builder Visa credit card are that There's no annual fees, interest, or credit check to apply, and you can build credit using your own money. Plus, you can get paid up to two days early with direct deposit. And there's 60,000 fee-free ATMs you can use, which is huge. I always hate paying like 350 to get my own money out. So start building your credit. Open a Chime checking account with at least a $200 qualifying direct deposit to get started. Get started at chime.com slash gas. That's chime.com slash gas. The Chime Credit Builder Visa Credit Card is issued by the Bancorp Bank NA or Stride Bank NA members FDIC. Out of network ATM withdrawal and over the counter advance fees may apply. Call 1 844 6363 for details. Late payment may negatively impact your credit score. Results may vary. Early access to direct deposit funds depends on payer. Spot me eligibility requirements and overdraft limits apply. So the DRM series saw Porsche 935s battle it out against BMW 320i's and Lancia's Beto Monte Carlo attempt oh. to take on the uh, Kramer K3s to no avail. The car's such a beta. <laughs> Dude. Look at, the, oh. look at the Beamer. It's oh, interesting looking. The Beamers are sick. Yeah. 
These are sick. The Lancia doesn't have a lot of extra hoo ha on it. No, <laughs> it not a lot of extra hoo ha. But that Beamer, you could eat a Christmas goose off the front. Yeah, of that you apron. could. Sure could. You wouldn't want to if you're on on Ozempic. But. That's a that's a front apron that Martha Stewart. Really <laughs> of. Uh, so Ford desperately wanted to take down the 935, but after the oil crisis and the closing of its main in-house racing facility. They knew they needed Zach Speed. Under the watchful eye of Zach Speed, Zakowski, and Ford Europe chief engineer Thomas Amershalger, the team schemed to create the ultimate Group 5 silhouette racer. Based on the Ford Mark III Capri, it was known as the Zach Speed Capri Turbo. Zach Speed sounds like a barbecue restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, oh, we're Steve going to Speed. Zach Speed's. Oh, pick me up some sauce. Yeah. yeah. Give me a bottle of they Zach Speed's sauce. They sell it by the, spicy by the pickles, bottle. Maybe? You can get it a bottle $23. There. Will you get me a bottle of Zach Speed's mustard sauce? <laughs> it's the yellow one. Yeah, this thing is rad. Super wide body. Super, I mean, it's a race car. Yeah. It's almost like, like if you put the fenders next to each other, it's like half the width of the car. Yeah, this thing F's hard. It's 650 horsepower. But also tenderly. To answer your uh, question, the Beamer. Are you kidding me? The 320i makes 650 horsepower from a four-cylinder? That's nutty. What Ooh, the heck? Straight up bonkers bananas. Well, the Capri is a 1.4 liter. That's a banana split. Jeez Louise. Wow. Uh, as with most other Group 5 monsters, the A and C pillars were the only things taken from the production car, <laughs> <laughs> aside from yeah. ancillary bits like rear taillights. The Capri would use a BDA-derived 1.4-liter twin cam, 16-valve, four-pot, at first, <sighs> boosted with twin turbos nice. slung from the side <clears throat> on a convoluted turbo manifold manufactured from a chrome-nickel alloy in an attempt to manage heat issues. Because, yeah, you're going to be making a lot of heat with two yeah, turbos right two there turbos. next to each other. you got two turbos, you're going to make a lot of heat. You're going to be making a lot of heat with two turbos. Two turbos, you're going to be making a lot of heat. You better make that. Goose you better have turbos. a pretty convoluted turbo manifold. Yeah, you might want to make it out of too. chrome nickel alloy. <laughs> <laughs> with twin intercoolers and four throttle bodies, it was good for 370 horsepower and weighed less than 1,300 Whoa, pounds. I bet that's uh, really that's fun. Insane. That's fun. That's so light. To achieve that insanely light weight, the Capri featured an alloy space frame with the roll cage as an integral part of the structure. The suspension pickup points mirrored those of the production Capri, and Zach Speed used past experience working with the Capri RS3100 to make these work reliably. And aesthetically, the Zach Speed took the silhouette concept to an extreme. This car sat low, at only 43.7 inches. The entire car barely came up to the sill of the original. Then they added a big wing and big fenders. The monstrous boxed arches covered the 19 by 12 and a half inch rear and 16 by 10 inch front BBS wheels, Ugh. as well as <laughs> as well as housed the radiators in That's ducts so sick. to yeah. keep the 1.4 liter engine Had cool, calm, and collected. 19s in the back and 16s in the front. That is wow. wow. It's like a Big Daddy Roth car. That's nutty. It's nutty. It's nuttier than a freaking organic protein bar. Yeah. Take on a hike. Yeah. yeah. The one with like Ha-ha. two ingredients. Yeah. yeah. That's nuttier a than- A kind gr- bar. Yeah. Kind bar. It's nuttier than a kind bar, it's Joe. Guttier than- Kind bar. Nuttier. Your bars hurt my teeth. <laughs> it's nuttier than Gwyneth Paltrow's poop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's a lot of seeded bread. Seeded bread. No bread. No gluten. Oh, yeah. Not Gwyneth. Well, it's made out of rice. <laughs> it's made out of rice. rice. She probably didn't eat <laughs> rice either. The Zach Speed Capri made its first official run at the DRM title in 1979 with three Capris on the Division II grid. Harold Ertil and Hans Heyer were the team's permanent drivers, with the third car driven by a revolving roster of drivers. Uh, the Capri a roster. Yeah. Uh, the Capri took the season by storm and walked away with the Division II title. But while the DRM had two divisions, it only had one winner. And that honor belonged to the Division I ace, Klaus Ludwig, and his creamer, <laughs> 935 K3. Kramer. 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 Kramer 935. 1980 saw Zach Speed double down on the Capri. Taking the fight to the 935 in Division I, they swapped the 1.4 liter engine for a larger 1.7 twin turbocharged engine capable of up to 600 horsepower and added a monster front splitter and towering rear wing. But they went beyond just retooling the car. 
they stole Klaus Ludwig from Porsche. Oh, just like Krampus steals children mm-hmm. every Christmas. Yeah. Bad and children. Gives them to Epstein. No. <laughs> what? No. Okay. Too dark. <laughs> <laughs> Topical. That's, uh, that's lo- the world we live in, Joe. It is. It's a dark yeah, we world. live in a world where Krampus is. Yeah. Bad. yeah Check Krampus out the new bad. Codmouth Kings <laughs> track, Krampus, Krampus, featuring BDI I don't Dark think, World. Yeah. There is a song they did with uh, Violent J or Shaggy Too Dope. Which one? <laughs> Which one? Uh, that matters. I forget. Yeah, they're completely different. I, I don't know. It matters to us. <laughs> well, they have very different. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I don't know, dude. I'd listen to the "This Is Cottonmouth King" Spotify playlist on my way home a couple of days ago. Just yeah, to get in the God, desert truck kind of it? mindset. It's literally all about smoking weed. Really? There is no metaphors for anything else. It is just literally smoking yeah. weed. just smoking that's, weed. That's uh, that's cool. They're ha- they they're having a good time. Delegalize it. <laughs> Recriminalize <laughs> marijuana. We. Oh, it's the f- the police song. That's right. Oh, it's not no. a cover of f- the police. No, it's their own song. Oh. Yeah, called f- the police. It's very funny. That one's not about smoking weed. No, I don't think so. Do they smoke weed at all in it? I think they do. Okay, and that's what leads to their trouble with the police. Got it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, now you wouldn't have trouble with it because it's not. Illegal, right? So they would have never written that masterpiece. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we need to recriminalize it so yeah. we can get songs. We can get like the music that. back. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So Ludwig told Kramer that if they couldn't pay him more than seventy thousand Deutschmarks or sixteen thousand U.S. dollars, what? then he was gone. Yo, sixty-one thousand. Oh, that that's today. Oh, so yeah. So that's sixty-one grand today. Uh, and they couldn't pay him that, so he left. Then Kramer sued him for his entire net worth, which put him, in Klaus's own words, quote, back to zero. And so, for the 1980 season, a penniless and pissed-off Le Mans winner and former DRM champion Klaus Ludwig would be piloting the souped-up Capri, capable of reaching 600 horsepower and more than 180 miles an hour. Dude, they sued him? What a bunch of chumps. Yeah, that's pretty chump shit. Yeah, it's Perhaps straight up. Unsurprisingly, though, competitors complained. The car was protested for the new front splitter and over wide wing. So Zaxby decided to go even further and introduced full-length ground effect Venturi tunnels with flexible side skirts. Yeah, bitch. These modifications created a suction effect and kept Lugwood in front until the skirts would inevitably wear out. Nice. Despite the team's dominance, the aforementioned complaints led to controversy over the revisions to the wing, and the team was stripped of some valuable points. And as a result... The 1980 title still belonged to Porsche. What a bunch of wieners, though. Wieners. Like complaining and suing. Yeah. Wieners. After the 1980 DRM season, Ford came to Zaxfeed with an interesting proposal. Having dipped their toes back into European racing, Ford was itching for a triumphant return to the U.S. scene. America was quick to adopt the burgeoning Group 5 regulations laid out by the FIA in 1976 and had been running them under the banner of IMSA's GTX category. Oh, okay. And much like Europe, the Porsche 935 was dominating. Although the racing was close, IMSA president John Bishop worried that no one would continue to pay to see a Porsche win every race. As cars became increasingly uncompetitive against the onslaught of 935s, Ford's special vehicles operations looked to the success of the Zach Speed Capri and came up with a plan to end its decade-long hiatus from American racing. You don't want SVO on your ass. You do not want FSVO on your ass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have to put a cream, you have to get a cream for it. You gotta get a cream for your F- ass. FSVO. That's, yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it's really itchy. Sorry, guys. I can't play yeah. golf today. I got F- SFVO. <laughs> Chafy. I had to go to the doctor. They gave me an, a salve. They looked at my ass. Yeah. Yeah. My doctor looked yeah. at my <laughs> ass. My doctor looked at my ass. They had to get out the ass scope. and they had to get my ass yeah. scope. Yeah. One time I had this like boil on my butt cheek. <laughs> yeah. And I went to the doctor. And they like lanced it, and it uh-huh. was like so awful. Was it did it stink? 
Yeah, the, she actually said she was like, "Oh my god, it stinks." <laughs> <laughs> That's unprofessional. Yeah, yeah. And uh, <laughs> then they like shoved gauze in it, and I had to go back like three days later. To oh, get was the this gauze a pillow didn't out. assist? Probably. I had one of these as well. Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah. And I had to get it taken. The gauze taken out. You gotta like, wash the doctor you know? or the nurse or the medical assistant who took it out was so hot. Dude, same. Yeah. <laughs> she was so same. hot. And she was like pulling the gauze out of my ass sore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was so embarrassed. What? Do you have the same experience? Same experience. I wonder if it was the same person. Probably not. <laughs> That's their only job is like pulling Well, no, gauze this was like a trainee. Ass. It was like one of her first days, I think, at the hospital. She oh, was like, no. uh, you know, like shadowing like, another I doctor. Quit. Yeah. Yeah, and I was like, this is the most embarrassing day of my life. Right yeah, here. speaking of shadows, like let's get something. back to the silhouette series. <laughs> nice. Let's see if Ford can lance out. <laughs> <Poor Yeah. son. laughs> it was the size of a golf ball. No. Yeah, yeah on my butt. I bet it stunk so bad. Yeah. <laughs> I remember consistency this similar to or if cream you just got cheese. Picked up. <laughs> 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 hey, our, our order from Brooklyn Bagels is here. <laughs> <laughs> Cream cheese. Uh, oh, that's so uh, gross. All right. The plan would come in the form <laughs> of the Zack Speed Mustang. Now, if you're a massive Mustang fan and you're wondering why we're two-thirds through our story and just now getting to the Mustang part of the episode titled The Mustang That Took Down Porsche. Oh, I know this car. Listen, we've got some bad news for you. Some say that the Ford Porsche Killer Mustang Turbo was, in fact, just a rebodied Zack Speed Capri. Zack Speed had been commissioned by Ford to develop a continuation of the Capri with a Mustang shell. The recent success of the Capri in the DRM was an excellent jumping off point for the official return of Ford to U.S. motor racing. After their pause in the 1970s, thanks to the oil crisis. And what better way to return to form than beating the 935s. I don't care that's a Capri. Yeah, I don't care that it's a Capri. It's still Ford. Mustang, yeah, I don't Capri, care if it's a Capri. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. It looks nothing like a Mustang. <laughs> <laughs> it Listen, looks nothing like a Mustang. <laughs> I'm all about the U.S. smashing Germans. It, it's definitely just the Capri with the Mustang sticker on the front. Um, this is like the worst gen of Capri, or of Mustangs, too. With right? Fox body? Early Fox body, not the worst, but this the like uh, really close together front headlight version. Dude, I would daily, <laughs> I would daily group five race car. <laughs> <laughs> I bet it just sounds <laughs> teeth just get rattled out, <laughs> like everything just <laughs> yeah. yeah, everything like power steering Your brakes sound like that <laughs> power steering <laughs> engine. Fuel pump. Fuel pump. Just a lot of ah, yeah. little tiny electric motors yeah. are, 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 yeah. are yelling at you. But that's the kind of stuff that gets my blood pumping. <laughs> that's the kind of stuff that gets my goat going. That's the kind of stuff that really makes my heart bleed. <laughs> With the help of Bill Shot Racing, the Ford team took the 1.7 liter four-cylinder turbocharged engine of the Zaxby Capri and wrapped it in a shell evocative of a Mustang streetcar. Then the team... Bullshit! <laughs> it looks nothing like it. <laughs> it uh, it's evocative. <laughs> sure. It's evocative of one. Sure. All right. All right. Then the team redesigned that Mustang bodywork to maximize downforce, adding a huge rear wing, extended front splitter, and wide fender arches. This car, I guess the pillar gentlemen, was a fast, <laughs> capable of over 600 hertz and in one more nod to the Mustang's Capri roots, Ford decided it would tap none other than Klaus Ludwig to drive uh, for its inaugural season. They better pay him this time. They better pay him. The stage is set, okay? The 1981 IMSA Camel GT would be the battleground for Ford's final push against Porsche's reign. And while the inside of the car couldn't be more German, the Miller-sponsored livery Hell yeah, and Mustang brother. shell said American a beer sponsored car and a cigarette company sponsored race I dare you to find something more eagle than that 
It says Miller time. On the front on splitter. splitter. That's, That's pretty tight. cool. Yeah. Mustang, Ford, Team Miller. I feel like they should reverse those, right? Whatever, man. It's Miller time. I don't oh, care. it also says it's Miller time on the back. Wing. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, the field in the 1981 IMSA Camel GT was fierce. There were over 10 Porsche 935 set to compete with several K3s driven by the likes of John Fitzpatrick and Bobby Rahal. I know that guy's name. Along with Corvettes, Datsun Zs, nice. BMW M1s. ZXs, like my car. Just like your car, Joe. The M1s uh, were sponsored by Red Lobster Racing. Nice. And by the fifth round, the new Lola T600. Not to mention, there was a 280ZX driven by Academy Award winner and official coolest guy in the yeah. world, Paul Newman. Paul Rudd. Paul Rudd. Uh, Paul Newman. Needless to say, Klaus would have his work cut out for him. The Mustang stormed the circuit in its debut performance at the third round of the IMSA GTO at Road Atlanta, the 100 miles. Klaus came within .144 seconds of a win, wow. finishing on the heels of John Fitzpatrick's 935. It was clear that Ford was back in a big way. Big way. In the words of Mickey Mattis, Ford's racing marketing manager at the time, quote, Sorry, I'm looking at the red lobster beef. <laughs> <laughs> I was at Road Atlanta for the debut of the Miller Mustang on April 12th, 1981. We hosted a major event on the hill at Turn 5 for dealers across from a trackside billboard claiming, The Boss is Back. <laughs> it marked the return of Ford to active competition. That's so cocky. The Boss That's is Back. That's just this guy telling about a thing he did. I know, The Boss <laughs> is Back billboard. The Boss is Back. That's sick. Well, he's a marketing guy. Yeah, he's a so marketing like he guy. Loves, that's what he lives for is that kind of stuff. Yeah, this guy I live for the billboards. Rules. They, they love their billboards. Uh, but Klaus and his Mustang were just getting started. Ford didn't just want a solid performance. They wanted a win, <laughs> damn it. And finally, on June 14th, <laughs> that's exactly what they got. Screaming down the Brainerd International Raceway after taking the lead from John Paul Jr.'s Lola T600, Ludwig battled Fitzpatrick's 935 once again. But after Fitzpatrick suffered problems with his battery, it was no competition. On lap 29 of 42, Ludwig and his Mustang took first, averaging 110 miles per hour with a margin of victory of 53 seconds. Second, third, and fourth places all went to 935s. Even more spectacularly, this was the first American car to win a Camel GT since 1977. On the win, Klaus later said, quote, Running alone in the lead is much harder than running in tight competition. You want to run fast enough to keep your concentration, but you also have to be steady as to not break the car. <laughs> because battery problems led to a Mustang victory over the 935, fans may have assumed the win was a fluke. But Sears Point, or Sonoma Raceway, two races later, would prove them wrong. It started with a bang. Klaus immediately jumped out to a big lead, but it wouldn't be Fitzpatrick and his Porsche that he'd be battling. Instead, Brian Redman and a Lola T600 quickly caught up, eventually passing. Unswayed, Klaus put on a charge, doggedly pursuing the Lola. It's hard to tilt Klaus. Can't tilt man. Can't put him on tilt. Nope. As they entered their last lap, they spotted something ahead. It was Paul Newman and his monster of a Datsun V8 Turbo, desperately trying to escape a last place finish. Redman had to slam on the brakes to avoid hitting the Datsun in the corners, and Klaus, hot on his heels, made contact. Both cars spun. But Klaus was able to get himself going again nice. and was able to hold off Redman for the win. Whoa. Wow. As the Mustang passed the finish line, we all have to believe Fitzpatrick in his 935 read the it's Miller time livery and recognize that just as American Titans, Miller and Anheuser-Busch toppled Germanic brewing hegemony, so too could Ford topple Porsche. I mean, Miller and Anheuser-Busch, those are both German names too. And they use Germanic brewing. Tech. Never mind. I'll they're see over myself here in America. Up. They're over here in America it's ruining in a, everything. <laughs> it's using a German piece of land, recipes. Dude, it's different. Man, it's they, different, man. They came over here and then bought everything and made everything worse. Because <laughs> that's the American way. I really want to go back to Milwaukee and just drink make, a giant beer and eat a hot dog in the park. Make everything yeah. a little bit yeah. worse. Though it may not seem like much, Sears Point marks the end of the 935's reign. It's no coincidence 
Klaus fought tooth and nail with the T600 and not a 935 to secure the Zack Speed Mustang's legacy. In the years to follow, it wouldn't be the Mustang that defined American racing. The past had belonged to the 935, but the future belonged to the T600. Just like the future also belongs to the T800 and the TX, what, if T1000. we're not careful. <laughs> T-1000 was T-1000. Arnold? No, T-800 was Arnold. T-800's Arnold. T-1000 uh, is... With the high cheekbone guy? Yeah, oh, shit. What's his name? I feel not like Ray his... Liotta. Not Ray Liotta. Not... That should narrow it down a little bit. <laughs> but he looks like Ray Liotta. Robert Patrick. Robert Patrick. One of the greats, honestly. I love How him. did I forget that name? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I watched Avatar last night. <laughs> again? <laughs> again? No, I watched the first one, oh. <laughs> dude. And again, James Cameron is so good at the like, all right, you son, son yeah, of a son, like getting yeah. ready to go out. Yeah, it, with it, Stephen Lang. He's a great dude. That guy, that guy is so the perfect good. army I love guy. Him. Yeah. First one, I think, is a little boring after on a, a repeat viewing. Yeah. In the theaters, well, I haven't 3D, seen it forever. It was so good in theaters, And I dude. just watched Way of the Water. Way of the Water is good, too. So I'm now, afraid I'm, to now watch that again, though. Now it's like I'm watching a prequel. Yeah. Well, are you excited that there's three more Avatars coming out? Yes. I'll go see every Avatar movie. I'll see any, I will see any movie that Jam, James Cameron puts James out. James Cameron rolls. He's the best. The Abyss? The Abyss, so Great good. Movie. Slept on a little bit. Yeah. That rat... Breathing in the water is a real thing. Mm-hmm. It's oxygenated. And that's gel why water the uh, a little physical media drama for you. That's why the uh, the new Abyss 4K isn't coming out in Europe. Is because animal animal torture? Animal, uh, animal rights. Yeah. And really? it's, it's seen as animal abuse drowning a rat in oxygenated fluid, even though it lived. Whoa. Yeah. I mean, it is weird. Yeah. yeah super weird. Yeah. I could go either way on that. But sure. Yeah. I don't care, honestly. <laughs> I don't give a shit. <laughs> For a brief shining moment in 1981, Klaus Ludwig... I killed a rat this month. This month? Yeah. How? The trap. Okay. Oh, Smashed yeah. Smashed his little neck. Mm. He was cute. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. In his dead form? Yeah. A little sad. Yeah. What kind of ruckus was he causing in your so house? So he... We left the door open... When we went out one time, and then which we don't make a we don't do, <laughs> so don't come into my house and hide in my closet and murder me when I go to sleep. But uh, he snuck in, mm-hmm. and then he was like under our sink area, mm-hmm. uh, and like we would just hear him. And then at night he would come out and poop. Oh, and so I would the dog also freak out hearing the noises and stuff? Or? No. No? She didn't do anything. Mm. She only cares about the mailman. Mm. <laughs> uh, but I put a little peanut butter in a dog food. Oh. Mm. Loved it mm. until he died. Mm. But he was cute. He was like an outdoor rat, so he didn't have like a pink tail. He had like a brown kind mm. of furry tail. <laughs> <laughs> Ugly. Uh, future belonged to the T600. However, for a brief shining moment in 1981, Klaus Ludwig's Porsche Killer Mustang proved it could beat them all. Later that same year, Klaus would return to DRM in a Zack Speed Capri, winning 9 out of 13 races, putting an end to Porsche's claim to the title. Finally, an effective nail in the coffin for the 935 during the last year of Group 5. Klaus spent the next several seasons racing for Ford in America in collaboration with Zack Speed. He piloted a string of Zack Speed Mustang evolutions in the waning years of IMSA's GTX class and into the post-Group 5 era, culminating in Ford's sci-fi single-speeder 1986 Mustang Probe, a carbon fiber chassis sports car with a 2.1 liter engine that when boosted could provide up to 750 brake horsepower, or as Klaus described it, Shit was quick. <laughs> that I gotta see this thing, dude. Zack Speed Probe. Yeah. yeah. Sci-fi single seater. Yeah. Seven Eleven. It doesn't look like a. It do, it's not like a normal group. No, five it looks car. like it looks, the Lola. It looks more like a prototype. Yeah, that yeah. makes sense. If that's group Five do. special production would come to an end in 1982 with the introduction of Group B. Ooh. With the with the rule change effectively bringing the disappearance of bespoke racing machines like the ones seen in previous years. The FIA's goal was to apply Group B requirements to cars designed for circuit racing, but with the increasing popularity of the World Rally Championship, Group B regulated circuit racing quickly faded into obscurity. Fortunately for us, the flame-spitting monsters of Group 5 continue to live on in the memories of motorsport fans around the world. 
I think silhouette cars are some of the sickest. They're so sick. Definitely. And they've inspired some of the coolest things like, you know, Bozuzoku is a little bit inspired by them. I've definitely RWB. Oh, for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, tries to capture that same feel of uh, one of these cars. RWB. I mean, also, I mean, on that same token, like Rocket every kind of like Rocket Bunny, Rocket all Bunny, the kind of wide Walk. body kits yeah. mm -hmm. out there. Definitely. Where you see, those. it's like anytime you see a regular car just peeking oh. out. Yeah. Dude, the, uh, the new Nissan like concept car that they showed off last night in Japan mm -hmm. at the auto salon, uh, that was They're inspired. Like GTR looking one. Yeah, that was inspired by their silhouette oh. uh, race car, their Skyline silhouette cool. car, and it looks very um, silhouette. -y. Yeah, it does. We got some listener mail. Uh, hey guys, I'm Ethan Tampkin, a 12 year old boy <laughs> with hopes of being a race car driver, and I love listening to your podcast when I play video games and do chores. That awesome. is so sweet. That's Ethan. what I also do when I listen to podcasts. Yeah, video games and yeah. chores. My favorite episode is. The guy won Le Mans drunk, a.k.a. Duncan Hamilton. That is also one of my favorite ones. Episode. It's a really fun. I would like you to do an episode on the history of Volvo in rally. Even though they did not compete in Group B rally, Volvo is cool. Yeah. Happily, Ethan T. And that you are right about that. Volvo is cool. Yeah, let's put it on the list. Volvo rally. Throw it on the list. Um, and thank you for writing in, Ethan. Yeah. Do your homework, Ethan. Yeah, go do your homework. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, if you want your um, letter <laughs> read on the podcast, you can email us at passgas at donutmedia.com uh, or you can email Nolan at mrsharrystyles at gmail.com. Let's sign off, Nolan. Get off your Sorry. Phone. I got tagged in something. Oh, we better check that yeah. out. Everybody wait. We got like you weren't on your phone the half of this not episode. Not while I'm supposed to. I not saw half. You. I right, saw thanks you. for joining not us. Even, See you next not week. even a little Bye. bit. I saw you. Not, definitely not what I was supposed to be doing something. Uh huh. I was looking at the Red Lobster M1. Okay. <laughs>